Hello and welcome to the Elements of Preservation. The following series of webinars marks the beginning of the training that is part of Finding Common Ground, collaborative training for the cultural heritage and emergency response communities. Finding Common Ground is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and administered by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners and supported by our partners, Coordinated Statewide Emergency Preparedness in Massachusetts, also known as COSTEP Mass, the Massachusetts Archives, the New England Museum Association, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the, and the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services. The Elements of Preservation consists of recorded webinars that will help all participants come to, to the first in-person workshop at the same level. I'm your instructor, Danya Khan, and I am a preservation consultant for cultural heritage institutions living in upstate New York, but many of you may know me from my time working at the Northeast Document Conservation Center or as an adjunct faculty member for Simmons College in Boston. I also have worked in conservation for many years and was the head conservator at um, <clears throat> Northwestern University and I was the rare book conservator for Syracuse University. And so um, I am, have a lot of experience in both libraries, archives, and museums, and I've dealt with a lot of disaster response. So hopefully you will learn a lot from these courses. If you have any questions when progressing through these recordings, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm always willing to help. We do have a fundamental problem, and that fundamental problem is that the collections in our libraries, archives, and museums are, like all of us, slowly deteriorating, and there's really nothing we can do to stop it. We can, however, slow it down, and thus extending the life and usability of our collections. Obviously, our collections deteriorate for a reason, and for most of our collections, for several reasons. It's a matter of cause and effect. Some of the causes are inherent to the materials and some are external, and we will be discussing those causes in just a moment. So, <clears throat> what is preservation? Preservation basically entails the global activities associated with maintaining collections for use and display, whether in their original format or in some other usable format. The primary goal is to prolong the lifespan of our cultural materials, and here the key word is the global activities. In preservation, we really are going to be looking at our collections as a whole and not as individual items. Sometimes we will look at them as individual items, for, but for the most part, preservation is very much a global activity. So what does it entail? <clears throat> it, preservation entails many different aspects, as illustrated here. This is a diagram of um, a brainstorming course that we, or a brainstorming session we did in one of my preservation classes at Simmons and getting the students to think about what all goes into preservation. And we could begin by making a big list, but let's think more thematically at this point. We need to identify the needs of our collection materials, both physical and digital. And this is one of the most common types of work that we do in preservation. Identifying the needs include risk assessment, which we will be covering in our first uh, in-person workshop, general preservation surveys, um, assessments of storage, and building inspections. We also want to, in general, select what we are going to preserve because we never have enough money to preserve everything, and so we need to take a look at our, our funds and our time and our staff to determine what we are going to preserve. And we do this um, in many different activities, and it can include um, acquisitions, it can include cataloging, arrangement description, it can include circulation, it can include written policies, it can include exhibits, um, as well as our institutional priorities. Um, <clears throat> And then there's planning, and planning plays a strong role in what we do to ensure a stable storage environment, um, stable exhibits, and safe exhibits. Um, planning goes into our disaster arena, as well as collections care, as and our digital collections, um, both in terms of our born digital, as well as in our reformatting projects. Okay, so now let's start to look at that list. Um, the basic elements of a preservation include, but are not limited to, 
environmental monitoring, which provides moderate temperature and humidity levels, as well as controlling exposure to light pollutants. We will have storage and handling um, using chemically stable storage enclosures and proper storage furniture. Uh, security is going to be an issue for us, and that includes protecting collections from theft or vandalism. Um, <clears throat> and there's also pest management, which is, of course, collecting our pest, our collections, protecting our collections from two, four, six, eight, or no-legged critters. Um, heaven only knows what we can get. Disaster planning is another big part of preservation, and that's what this entire series is going to cover. So we will be doing that quite in depth throughout the next couple of years. Uh, reformatting, which is reproducing our very deteriorated collections, um, especially in libraries and archives, onto stable media to preserve the informational content. And then there is also treatment, which we... Uh, in the case of this program, we will really be looking at what we would do after a disaster. Um, we will be really focusing on our digital collections. We really want to think about advocacy and outreach as part of preservation because we can't do this work in a void. And then there's always the management aspect. Um, and advocacy and outreach and management will also become a big part of our disaster planning and response process. So what is one way that we can really begin to think about preservation in our institution and begin to plan for it? And the, probably the biggest guidance that we will get um, in many ways is our mission statement. Because most institutions don't have specific written policies for preservation or collection development for that matter, um, it's really best to start with our mission statement. And the mission statement is really the driving force behind what an institution is and does, or at least it should be. Um, it also helps to define the institution um, in terms of what it collects. And this is a way to really focus and um, drill down into just who you are and what you want to be. Because if you don't know who you are, then you're patrons, your public, your community doesn't know what you are, and things can really get muddled quickly, and you turn out or wind up having too many collections items that you can really care for um, well. And so your mission statement really helps to focus your attention. <clears throat> A well-defined mission statement will identify the audience to which its efforts of staff and the expenditure of resources are primarily primarily geared. Um, decisions about access, preservation planning, exhibition, and any future acquisitions will be most effective if they always relate back to the mission statement. And I can't tell you how many institutions I have worked with that really have not had a well-defined mission statement and are really in a, a quagmire of too much stuff, not enough place to put it, and not enough people to manage it. And it really becomes uh, quite a mess and very problematic for the institution to really present to the general public who they are and what they do. So uh, your mission statement is very important. But along with that mission statement, we really do want to think about some other written policies, not just policies that everybody understands, but definitely written down. Um, one of those is the collecting policy, and that's going to expand upon and support the mission statement by providing details on the nature, range, and extent of the collections, both current and future, as well as the audience that the institution serves. The collecting policy is not the only guidance helpful for ensuring that the pres not uh, the collecting policy is not the only guidance helpful for ensuring the preservation of the collection. You should also have a collections management policy, and the collection management policy goes beyond the collecting policy to the actual care of the collection. So this would be how the collections are going to be stored and housed and treated um, and deaccessioned when the time comes throughout the institution. And so the policy should indicate the desired scope and depth 
of the collection, as well as identifying subject areas and formats to be collected. So you also want to look at um, a preservation policy. And preservation policies don't get a lot of attention. Um, there isn't a lot in the current literature on preservation policies, but what there is a growing body of literature for are preservation um, plans for digital collections, preservation policies. When reviewing the core sections of what's recommended for a digital preservation policy, um, it's apparent that these sections can likewise be applied to the physical collections and probably were developed out of other preservation policies. So um, when you're looking at your preservation plan, you need to have an, a definite aim, so a small mission statement just for your preservation of your collections. Um, you want to think about what standards you're going to use, what content you're going to cover, um, what the overview of your preservation strategy is, so what approaches are you going to use, um, what methods and levels of preservation will you use. So for some of us in libraries and archives, especially if you're um, doing records management, you think about how long collections will be retained so you know how long you need to be preserving them for. Um, you want to think about implementing a strategy and sustainability plans. And we really didn't get into talking about sustainability in preservation until digital preservation came along. But that funding source is going to be so important for uh, the preservation of our collections that it's really uh, a good idea to think about sustainability in terms of the preservation of your physical collections at well, as well. Um, while these policies we've been discussing may seem obvious to us, uh, there are advantages to having it written down. And that's not only uh, for staff to be able to refer to a written document if they have a donor trying to give the institution something that it doesn't want or doesn't need or can't care for, um, but it also helps in the um, life of the institution to help uh, new staff coming in to understand the institution and as with any of our written policies they are they can be fluid so institutions change their mission um, the collecting policies change but to have these written down is really helpful to uh, give you a sense of history in your institution so we really want to make sure that we have these written down and that they are archived as part of our institution as well as read and used by our staff. Um, within these policies, it's also helpful to have some guidelines for practice. So processing guidelines, um, are your staff being consistent in terms of, and your volunteers, um, the work that they do either in cataloging, arrangement, description, or accessioning, and do they know what impact that has on preservation? Um, the care and handling of your collections, uh, you want to have a guideline for this, especially in museums, as many of the objects can be very fragile and need special handling. And then you also want to think about guidelines for housekeeping. Who does the cleaning in your institution? Do they understand how fragile some of your collections can be and how um, detrimental to those collections a lot of the cleaning fluids and whatnot can be? So we really want to think about having written guidelines for those as well. So we're going to move into the agents of deterioration now. We had mentioned up at the beginning that everything deteriorates, and now we're going to go into why. So I had mentioned that the deterioration of our collections is all about cause and effect, and that's really down to um, the chemical reactions going on in our collections as well as the external um, agents that can come to come into play to increase or decrease those chemical reactions and these two will almost always work together so chemical instability is introduced during the objects manufacture and we can slow this down but we cannot stop it so if you think Want some examples of chemical instability, we can look to our cellulose nitrate film, which deteriorates naturally in a rather detrimental way to the rest of our collections. 
Um, we can look at rubber cement adhesive that many of us may have either in scrapbooks or in collage for artwork. Um, we can also think about our friend and um, loving neighbor newsprint, which we know deteriorates very quickly. And so collections like this can be found, um, these chemical instabilities can be found throughout a lot of our collections. And so what we want to do is take a closer look at our external agents because there's not a lot that we can do to change the chemical instability of our collections. But what we can do is control what we can to slow those chemical reactions down. And those um, areas that we can control are heat, light, and humidity in particular. Um, pollutants, pests, disasters, poor storage materials and furnishings, um, the list can go on and on and on. And so what we want to do is focus on these now because these factors interact with the materials to either accelerate or slow their deterioration depending on what we have and what we're using. Um, so one of the things to always keep in mind is the Arrhenius equation and that's maybe taking some of you into a little bit of a out of your comfort zone in terms of chemistry but the Arrhenius equation simply says that for every 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature the chemical reaction rates double in our collections and what that says is that the deterioration rate of our collections will double. So the cooler we can keep our collections, the better. And we know that a lot of this is entirely in our control. And so we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to ensure that we're slowing those rates of deterioration. So looking a little bit more closely and a little bit more granular granularly at our agents of deterioration, we will um, see that they fall under uh, four main categories. And as we go through this webinar, um, we will be going into some of these more closely. But these agents of deterioration are the chemical. Um, so those inherent um, chemical reactions going on in our collection items. Um, we will look at the mechanical agents of deterioration, which uh, really include poor storage materials and um, poor handling, and also some of our poorly maintained equipment. So if we have um, malfunctioning HVAC units or no HVAC units, we can get a lot of mechanical damage to our collections. Um, our incidental are going to, is a nice way to say our disasters. So our water emergencies, fire, vandalism. And then biological agents of deterioration will obviously include our mold and pests. We also have some very specific agents of deterioration for our digital objects. And so we see that there is actually a long list. And a lot of our media failure and hardware failure, et cetera, can come down to the chemical reactions going on. But a lot of times it's really just down to small little tweaks in the data that's on there that causes the problems. So media failure is one of our most common agents of deterioration because our CDs or DVDs our storage tapes like our linear tape optical, um, any floppy disks that we may have, our flash drives or our portable hard drives um, fail frequently, unfortunately. Um, I would be surprised if there is any of us amongst this group that has not had something fail on them. And if you haven't had something fail yet, you will. And basically, if these the information on the media that you have is your only copy and they're not backed up, then you lose that information. So hardware failures, um, like our media failure, happen more than we would like. Um, I know I have gotten the blue screen of death on my computer more frequently than I would ever have hoped. And so again, 
thinking about how we're backing up this information. Software failure, although less common, can occur due to validation errors, corruption in the um, code, various bugs, um, viruses, and one of our other agents of deterioration for digital objects, obsolescence. Um, format obsolescence is one of our greatest problem when dealing with, I guess we could call them historic digital objects. Um, so we really need to make sure that when we're accessioning media into our collections that we have the software and hardware to open and read the information or we have somebody on staff who can work with the objects or you have the funds to outsource the work to get the information off of those um, various forms of media. Uh, power failures obviously restrict our access to digital collections but can also cause problems with our hardware depending on the cause of that power failure. So if you have a large power surge and you're not um, protecting your computers, that can be a real problem. Um, we have communication and network failures. So if you're doing a lot of transferring of information, you can get problems with drop packets and other uh, transfer issues. So again, reliable backups are very important. And finally, we can't forget organizational failures in terms of management, staffing, and budget. These can be just as damaging as all of the previously mentioned um, agents. And that actually goes for our physical collections as well as our digital. So looking at some common pests, we um, all have probably seen some or all of these in and around our collections, but we've got silverfish, which are most commonly found up north, um, but we may also see fire brats, which are a, a relative of the silverfish. We have the case making or webbing clothes moth. We have sosids, which uh, you'll find predominantly in paper collections because they like to um, dine on the microscopic mold on our paper. We have our friend, the cockroach. We have termites, which keep moving north as the climate changes, and so more and more of us will be having trouble with termites. We have the mouse. We have the rat. You know, basically, what they're going to do is they're going to chew and use our collections as nesting materials. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. I am sorry. And then we also have um, pigeons and bats, which hopefully we all know what they look like. So when we are thinking about pests in our collections, we need to start asking ourselves some questions. And the first one is, is there a history of pests in our building? Uh, for many of us, we probably have historic buildings. And basically, we know at some point we have probably had mice or rats in the building. I live in an old house uh, built in 1804. And my basement and foundation are basically like revolving doors come winter. I get mice and moles and voles. And so you just, it helps to have a history and know what has gone on in your building so you know what to plan for. Okay, what types of pests have you seen and where have you seen them? Um, what are your libraries, your archives or your museums policies for food and drink? Um, if you have little cafes, then that just adds another layer. Um, so if you have policies for food and drink, who's responsible for implementing them? Who's responsible for policing them? If nobody is, then you would have to ask the question why you have food and drink policies. Um, if food and drink are permitted in the building, where are they permitted? Do you limit them to certain locations or do you allow it to go everywhere? And then if you do have food and drink, which even if it's not supposed to be there, it probably is. How is food waste disposed of? Um, do you have, uh, does your housekeeping staff empty the garbage cans every day and take those, take that garbage out of the building or does it stay in the building overnight? 
Um, you might also want to ask where the dumpsters for your building is because if they are adjacent to your building, again, that can attract the, the mice, the rats, the squirrels, um, the raccoons, etc. That then can also be a problem to your building. And then do you have regular chemical treatments performed and what pests are these treatments for? And then are the chemical treatments absolutely necessary. And for some pests, yes, the chemical treatments are, but we should really try to determine if we need to go that chemical route because there is a process called integrated pest management. And integrated pest management is a chemical-free strategy that we would rather focus on when we can because it's going to be safer for us as well as for our collections. So the insects we just discussed um, are drawn to the plant-based and animal-based materials in our collections, including paper, um, animal-based adhesives, our textiles, our uh, woolen carpets, our wooden furniture, um, not to mention the batting and the uh, you know, upholstery on some of that furniture, um, feathers, our stuffed dead animals. Um, so many of our collections are really attractive to pests. And as I said before, our rodents can really cause damage um, to collections for nesting materials and leaving droppings that attract other pests. So, and then our regular insect pests, also when they die, their carcasses are attractive to other pests, so we really want to do what we can to keep the pests out. And it is a challenge. But through good integrated pest management activities, we can, again, like deterioration, slow down the tide of those pests. We will never be able to completely get rid of them, but we can really manage it and prevent um, a major infestation, which will be a big problem for us. So some um, integrated pest management strategies include sealing the routes of entry for the pests. Um, pests can come in through open windows that don't have any screens, um, air vents, poorly sealed windows and doors, cracks in the foundation, um, rotted uh, window frames and door frames. They can come in from just about anywhere. We want to really control our water sources. Um, our silverfish and cockroaches especially are attracted to damp, humid environments. And so we really want to um, control those water sources when we can. So main, uh, look at your drainage around your building. Look for any dripping faucets inside and outside. Um, any problems that you have with leaks in the basement or rising damp should be addressed. Things like that are what we want to watch out for. We want to control our food sources. Ideally, people won't be eating or drinking in the building, but this is next to impossible. So if you can confine the eating and drinking to one location that the trash can is emptied every day at the end of the day, then at least you'll be making some headway. Um, I worked at an institution where People could, staff could eat at their desks, and there was one department that liked to have a lot of parties, and that was the area of the institution that had the biggest mouse problem all the time. And it was impossible to control because the staff in that area refused to change their ways. So they just had a lot of mice in there, which was not the best of things, but you learn to fight your battles. That has all changed now, I have heard. So things are things can change. They just may take longer than you like. Um, you want to clean your collection storage areas as well as your public and exhibit spaces to look for signs of insects. Um, really getting your housekeeping staff on board with this can be invaluable because they're the ones really seeing the little piles of sawdust under the furniture or they know where all of the dead insects are gathering sort of thing. And so to get them on board will be a huge help to you. You always want to isolate and examine incoming collections. Pests can be introduced when 
either an infested item is brought into the collection or even infested boxes. So those cardboard boxes people bring donations in should be emptied and discarded as soon as possible. Um, cardboard, corrugated cardboard is a great living space for cockroaches and silverfish. So you really don't want to be bringing those into your collections. Um, you want to conduct routine monitoring. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. And then if you do have an infestation, the first resort should be to freeze or use anoxic environments for your infestations. And one of the nice things for all of us in Massachusetts is, is um, oh, uh, historic New England has two, oh, I believe there's uh, carbon dioxide chambers that um, one kind of a medium size and one a large size that can be utilized by museums in Massachusetts and the rest of New England for insect infestations. So at least in New England, we're really lucky that we have that resource. Um, finally, chemicals should really only be used as a last resort. Um, it can be very problematic to the collections and actually can make the collections more susceptible to problems in the future if chemicals are used uh, without serious thought. So if we're going to monitor for our pests, we're going to initially do it through visual means. And this is basically looking for insects and looking for the damage, looking for the frass, and looking for carcasses. And that's going to help give us an idea of what may be in our building and in our collections. And one of the best ways to do this is with sticky um, or blunder traps. If you're just curious as to what you have, you can use non-pheromone traps placed around the collections. Um, and you want to put these especially at the point where the floor meets the wall, so on the travel points for these insects. And then also near windows, near doors, um, near venting, any sort of place that the insects uh, could come in. But you can also get specifically targeted pheromone traps, especially for silverfish or the case-making and webbing clothes moths. And in the case of the moths, uh, you can hang those traps in your collection storage areas to trap the moths so that you can see what's happening. Because the moths are flying, they're not necessarily crawling along on the ground. And then always record the insects that you find um, and keep a running log. So uh, not only what insects you're getting, but when they're appearing and where they're appearing so that you can start to uh, keep a trend map going. And that will give you an idea. Um, so, you know, to go back to my, my house example, I know that I need to start putting out baited mouse traps um, somewhere around mid-September because that's when they're starting to think about coming inside to nest for the winter. So, you know, you start to see trends and then you can react to them and get on top of things sooner rather than later. Our other big biological um, agent of deterioration is mold. Um, if you've never had mold, trust me, you will at some point. So we're going to take just a moment to talk about mold, but I want to give you all a reminder that mold is everywhere and we cannot get rid of it, nor do we want to because it plays a very important role in our natural world. So mold um, is a generic term for a uh, family of fungi and microorganisms that depend on other organisms for sustenance. There are over 100,000 known species of fungi, and um, because of the great variety, mold's patterns of growth and activity um, can be unpredictable. And so we just don't know what's going to crop up, but we can make some broad generalizations um, as to mold's behavior. So mold propagates by disseminating a large number of spores. Um, if any of you have ever pinched a puffball mushroom, you 
have released many of those spores. Um, those spores become airborne and travel to new locations and germinate under the right conditions. When um, mold spores germinate, they sprout hair-like hyphae, um, what I tend to call the fuzzy stage, which in turn produce spore sacs that ripen and burst, releasing more spores, beginning the cycle all over again. While mold is actively growing and reproducing, it excretes digestive enzymes that alter, weaken, and stain our collection items. It's important to note that the mold can be dangerous to people with allergies and immunity problems, um, and in the case of Stachybotrys, can pose major health hazards. Luckily for us, Stachybotrys predominantly grows on building materials, so if you've just got mold on your collections, it's not necessarily going to be the highly toxic mold that we talk about, but you still want to take the precautions. And we will be talking about more of this when we get into the in-person workshops. Um, just know that dormant spores can survive in extreme environments, and they can remain viable for well over 20 years waiting for the right environment to germinate. So we really want to think about that when we are thinking about the environment that we are storing our collections in. So for mold to germinate or to become active, the spores require a favorable environment. So they need a certain level of relative humidity, they need a certain temperature, they prefer stagnant air, and they need a food source, which unfortunately for us tends to be our collections. Um, so what we want to do is to make sure that we are maintaining an environment that does not allow those dormant or inactive mold spores to become active. So one of the most commonly found factors that we can control is the relative humidity in the air. Um, but we also want to think about the natural, natural moisture content of the object that um, the mold could potentially grow on. In general, the higher the relative humidity, the more readily mold will grow. Um, so if your mold, uh, if your mold, if your relative humidity is over 75% or you have um, temperatures over 70 degrees, mold growth is really likely. Now, this needs to be sustained. Um, so if, you, if your relative humidity spikes for a day at 75 and then drops back down, you'll be okay. But if you start to have those conditions for a week or more, then you could very easily have a big problem. Um, generally, we like to keep our relative humidity at um, below 65, but even at 65, some species of mold can still grow, so we really like to keep it below 60. Um, and then, of course, we have the added problem, if our collections are wet as a result of a water disaster, this increases their susceptibility just because the, the relative humidity and that internal moisture content will be much higher. Um, so we also want to try to keep our temperatures low because warm temperatures also encourage mold growth. And then stagnant air, if you can keep air flowing, it doesn't have to be a, a hurricane force wind, but just to make sure air is flowing throughout your building and in all the little pockets will help to keep the mold actually on the move and won't allow it to settle long enough to germinate. And then, of course, we always want to think about where our collections are being stored. If they're being stored in a basement, then there's a higher susceptibility to mold problems as well as to pest problems. So I know some of us don't have an option. Um, collections need to be stored in the basement, but as long as we are aware of the problems that could occur down there, we can take steps to mitigate those um, mold and pest disasters from happening. So I am going to stop this. Oh, nope, I've got one more, sorry. Um, so what can we do? 
we're going to keep the um, humidity and temperature moderate. So we're going to keep our temperature below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and our relative humidity below 60%. And we're going to monitor that um, temperature and relative humidity to ensure the space is remaining within safe levels. And we'll get more into environmental monitoring in the next segment of this webinar. Um, we want to maintain good air circulation, so we want to make sure that if we've got um, an HVAC system that none of our vents are being blocked by collections. We want to make sure that um, if we don't have an HVAC system, maybe we have fans going to keep air circulating. Um, we don't want to store collections in known damp spaces, um, but sometimes we have to, so if we do um, we're going to keep those damp spaces clean, and we're going to keep our collections at least four inches off the floor and at least four inches away from any walls so that we can help um, keep down the mold by having good air circulation. Um, dust and dirt are also a good food source for mold, and so we want to be sure we're keeping things clean. Um, and we do, if we have an HVAC system, um, that's the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning centralized forced air systems that many of us may have, um, we want to make sure we're changing the filters according to the manufacturer's recommendations um, so that we can trap the mold spores that may be in the air and get rid of them rather than forcing them through the filter and back into the system. And finally, we're going to respond quickly to water damage. So if you get wet collections coming in, if you have a leak, we're going to really respond to those quickly. So thank you for joining me for this first segment of the Elements of Preservation. And I look forward to sharing more information with you in the subsequent sessions. Thank you.